Okay. Um, so let me get started. So to begin with, um, I have finished grading the test and I have published the grades. So if you go on Gradescope, you should be able to see the uh, grade you got. Overall, I think uh, this test went very well. Um, I think the average was around an 84%, which is quite high. Um, so certainly some congratulations are in order. Um, has anyone been able to actually access their grades on Gradescope or has anyone tried? Yeah, I'm yeah. looking at it now. Yeah, yeah, I just checked. Okay, great. So uh, I tried to give comments usually when I took off points. Um, of course, if you're curious about anything, uh, please ask. If you, um, here, here's another thing. If you think that I have graded something incorrectly, I'm happy to discuss it, but please don't just send me a regrade request email via Gradescope. Um, if you want to discuss something, please set up a time when we can actually discuss things. And then after our discussion, uh, if changes are in order, I can make changes. But um, basically, if you want to talk about the exam or do something about the exam, please send me an email and we can set up a time and actually discuss and chat. Um, what I do want to do is at least discuss a little bit about section question three, which was, um, I think, the most, most of the points that got taken off, got taken off uh, for question three. So let me just pull up um, the content of question three really quick. Um, question three was a problem about separable differential equations. So just a quick discussion. Um, let me get the midterm up. Ah, yes. OK. So the problem was as follows. Uh, consider the IVP associated with dy over dx is equal to negative x e to the x over y cubed plus one with y of zero being equal to one. Okay, so the first part of the problem was, is this, uh, what is the order? And linear or nonlinear? So can someone tell me how they think about this problem? First of all, what's the order of this problem? The first order. Mm -hmm. This is first order because order only cares about the highest derivative that appears. And here, the highest derivative that appears is just a first derivative of y in terms of x. So this is first order. Is this linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear because you have y cubed. Exactly. Nonlinear because we have a y cubed immediately. So, first order nonlinear. Part B of this problem asked uh, Does this have a solution? So, solution to IVP and uniqueness. So, if we have a first order nonlinear, what is the theorem that we can use? Or what, what does the theorem say? The f of, y, f of x, y um, and the partial of f with respect to y have to be continuous on some interval. Exactly. So we have existence and uniqueness so long as f of x, y and the partial of f with respect to y are continuous on a rectangle containing the initial data.
So for this problem, I needed to both see the function. Where is this function continuous? Like around zero. This function is continuous around zero. What, where do we have to avoid? Y equals negative one. Y equals negative one is the only place where this function won't be continuous because it's the only place where the denominator vanishes. So Y is equal to negative one is a place that we have to avoid for f of x. Wow. Uh, now we have to compute the partial of this function. Partial of f with respect to y is going to be equal to, in this case, it's going to be negative x e to the x times, really I should think of this as y cubed plus 1 to the negative 1, so uh, times, sorry, negative x e to the x times negative 1 times y cubed plus 1 to the negative 2 times 3y squared. Okay, so here is an expression for the partial of f with respect to y. The x variables don't get touched. Where is this function discontinuous? y equals negative 1. Again, y is equal to negative 1. The only thing that's in the denominator is uh, y cubed plus 1 to the power of 2. So once again, the bad locus, or the place where this is discontinuous, is at y is equal to negative 1. But our initial data is at x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 1. So our, our initial data is up here. And since we can draw rectangles around these places that avoid the bad locus, then existence and uniqueness tells us there exists a unique solution to this IVP locally. So have existence uniqueness. OK? I think a lot of points got taken off because I needed to explicitly see the second derivative and have you, you know, check exactly where this is um, not continuous. OK, so we have existence and uniqueness. And then the last part of this is how do we solve a differential equation like this. Separate and integrate both sides. Exactly. Uh, this is separable. In particular, we'll get a y cubed plus 1 uh, dy being equal to negative x e to the x dx. We're going to integrate both sides, this side with respect to y and this side with respect to x. So we get y to the fourth over 4 plus y uh, plus c, but I'll move the c over to the other side. What do I have to do to take the antiderivative of this side? Integration by parts. Yeah, integration by parts. If I integrate by parts, I'm going to get negative x e to the x minus, uh, well, it'll be plus the antiderivative of e to the x dx plus c. So overall, I get y to the fourth over 4 plus y is equal to negative x e to the x plus e to the x plus c. So this is the general form of the solution to this differential equation. And then the full solution requires me to solve the IVP, which means I need to actually plug in y being equal to 1. So I'll get 1 fourth plus 1 is equal to 0 times 1 plus 1 plus c. So we find that c has to be equal to 1 fourth. And then the final answer here is y to the fourth over 4 plus y is equal to negative x e to the x plus e to the x plus one fourth. Or if you choose to move things over to um, different sides, that's fine. But this is the, the equation which implicitly gives our solution. Hey, Mark. Yep. Um, I don't have the exam question in front of me, but I remember the question stating that you, you could leave your answer in the general form. So I didn't solve for C. 
So for three, I definitely, I have the exam in front of me and it says solve this IVP. You need only find the equation which implicitly defines the solution. Right. So I think I misunderstood that statement. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I can try to clarify uh, and hopefully that didn't take off very many points. To, to solve the IVP means essentially you need to find the correct constant. And so you're not finding mm -hmm. the general family, you're finding the constant which will make things work. However, you need only find the equation which implicitly defines the solution means I'm not trying to rewrite, I'm not trying to do expressions over here to get y on one side being equal to some function in terms of x. Right, right. Okay, that makes more sense now. Yeah. So solving the IVP means finding the correct constant, but I'm not writing this as a function, right? This isn't y is equal to stuff of x because I've got mm -hmm. this y to the fourth over four plus y, like it's something more complicated going on. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions uh, on this particular problem or on other problems? Um, yeah, I have a question on sure. this question, uh, question three. What is you must check DFDY in regards to? Maybe I'm just not seeing That means that I actually wanted you to compute what the partial derivative of this function with respect to y is. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be this. And then you need to, you know, I think a lot of people understood what was going on and they realized that this function would be continuous at negative one. But mm -hmm. for this test, I needed you to be very explicit with actually finding this partial derivative and saying, oh, once I have it in this form, I can see exactly where this is not continuous. All right, thank you. Yeah. So what did you take off points for for wrong derivatives? That's because if you, I, yes? Yeah. So I, I didn't do the integration by parts thing. I just left it as an integral, but I did do on left-hand side, but I know why I got points off for not integrating by parts, but all my other derivatives were right. Including the partial with respect to y? I didn't do that one, no. So did okay. you take points off for that and e also wrong derivatives? Yes, so probably it's uh, not so clear, but some points were for computing this partial derivative and computing it correctly. And then I also used, uh, there are also other points for doing the integration by parts part correctly. So you took points off like a lot of them if you didn't do the partial? Uh, I think I took off two points if you didn't compute this thing, but this problem was out of nine yeah. points, so. Okay, I also got points off for saying, you, you took off points for it is nonlinear minus one points, but I had nonlinear in the question. Oh, um, well that sounds like I misgraded it. Yeah, and I, so I, think, I think it is. I just I'll, be, of, I'll be happy to know. take a look at that, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, just send me an email and we can discuss that problem explicitly, but. Um, I think I had also misinterpreted it as like the general form. So I put it in the general form, like without the, the C constant solved, but I don't think you get any points for that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't exactly understand your question. Um, I'm just saying like, are there, were there any points for the general form if you were able to get that? Yes. Like which, which criteria gave points for the general form? Um, so I broke this up into nine points. So I believe I had two points for part A, two points for part B, and five points for computations in part C. So as long as you did some work or some integration on part C, you should have some points there. I believe I took off one point uh. if you didn't deal with C, and I took off more points from the five of part C, if you didn't complete the integration, for instance. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm happy with these questions, um, but I do maybe wanna say that um, it'd be good to answer more mathematical questions 
Um, and then I can discuss scoring kind of on an individual basis. Of course, it's important that you know how this is scored. So two points for part A, two points for part B, five points for part C and the way that that shakes out. Um, but uh, yeah, are there any other, yeah, okay. So any other questions? Question about question one. Question one, okay, yeah. Um, can you just explain, so the part of it that I got wrong was whether or not K was positive. Yeah, sure. And I'm just slightly confused as to, you left a comment about how once I got the equation, I should have been able to, you know, like check what happens as t went to infinity, which I didn't think about doing that. But I was just wondering how you would have been able to arrive at that conclusion without originally, since part A doesn't ask you to solve the differential equation is what I'm asking. You mean, how do you, like, how do you answer part A without solving the differential equation? Yes. Okay. So really all that I'm asking for is which corresponds to objects cooling. So what we know is that if we have a differential equation that looks like du over dt um, is equal to, in this case, it's going to be ku plus a constant plus kt, right? This is one way of writing what we've got. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have an equilibrium solution. Where is the equilibrium solution going to be? Or this is a minus, sorry. So the equilibrium solution is going to occur at u is equal to t, u of t is equal to t, right? Because then this will be zero. Right. So if we just plot out what the equilibrium solution looks like, so this is t, uh, there's an equilibrium solution here. And now we should check what does the differential equation do if k, say, is positive. If k is positive, greater than zero, then we have k times u minus t. If u is bigger than t, then this number is positive and this number is positive. So if k is greater than zero, the slope field will look like this. Above the equilibrium solution will have positive slope and below the equilibrium solution will have negative slope. Do you agree with that? Yes. But the solution curves to this look like this. In other words, this is saying, if you have an object that starts very close to the ambient temperature, with this model, as time passes, it will heat up more and more and more. Or if the object starts slightly below the ambient temperature, it will cool down towards negative infinity. Whereas if we look at the slope field for k less than zero, then you have reverse behavior. You still have the same equilibrium solution at t, but now above the equilibrium solution, the slope is negative, right? Because k times u minus t, if this is positive and this is negative, then the slope is negative. And if u is less than t, so this is negative and k is negative, then the slope is positive. And now the solution curves look like this, which says, even if something starts off very hot, it will eventually cool to the ambient temperature. And if something starts off very cold, it will rise to the ambient temperature. And that if you leave things on for a long enough time, all the temperatures are approaching the ambient temperature. Okay, that makes sense. Thank so you. So it's just trying to understand what what is the physical significance if we're trying to set up a model. How how do things behave? Well, if you you know set out a hot cup of coffee and leave it for ten days, then it'll probably end up being about the ambient temperature instead of exploding into unbelievably hot coffee. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, but overall, I think the scores on this first test were quite good. Um, so uh, please email me if you have questions. Um, let's discuss parts of this uh, test that you got wrong. I'm happy to do that. But overall, the scores were, were quite good. Yeah, so let's move on. Let's, uh, let's start going on to 
um, more material. Um, this. Okay. So in 3.1, we examined um, a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero if a x squared plus b x plus c x or plus c is equal to zero has distinct roots. So this is kind of like a very special case that we deal, dealt with of second order linear homogeneous differential equations where first of all all the coefficients are constant in t and this polynomial the characteristic polynomial has distinct roots right then in 3.2 we spent a very long time discussing existence and uniqueness ronskians a whole bunch of abstract general stuff So now in 3.3, what we'd like to return to are some of the other cases of this polynomial, of the characteristic polynomial where we have constant factors. So in particular, in 3.3, let's examine um, a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero, where um, b squared minus 4ac is less than 0. What does it mean if b squared minus 4ac is less than 0? It's a complex solution. Exactly. Um, if b squared minus 4ac uh, is less than 0, then the roots of ax squared plus bx plus c are complex conjugate numbers. Or I'll say complex numbers conjugate to each other. Can someone remind me what it means for one complex number? What, what's the conjugate of a complex number? It's like a plus bi and a minus bi. Yes, the conjugate of a plus bi is equal to a minus bi, and the conjugate of a minus bi is a plus bi. Yeah, a plus bi, exactly. So you're just uh, multiplying the coefficient of i by negative one. What's the complex conjugate of a real number? Itself. Yeah, it's just itself because any real number can be written as a plus zero i. And then when I change the, when I go from a plus zero i to a minus zero i, I haven't changed the number at all. Very good. Okay. Um, so, Formally, uh, we understand that if uh, a plus bi is a root of the characteristic equation, then what do we expect for the solutions if we remember what we did in 3.1? What should be a solution to this differential equation? Naively, as a naive guess. How did we get solutions when we didn't have complex conjugate roots? We assume y is of the form e to the rt. Yeah, exactly. Then e to the a plus bi t and e to the a minus b i t are supposed to be our solutions.
And indeed, these will be solutions because when you take derivatives, the condition that you have to require is that this coefficient is a root of the polynomial. So as long as taking derivatives of expressions like this yields the correct thing, that is, as long as d over dt of a to the bi times t is equal to a plus bi times e to the a plus bit, then these have to be solutions. Maybe I'll write this. Um, so long as d over dt of e to the a plus bi t is equal to a plus bi e to the a plus bi t, then these are solutions. Does everyone understand why this is the case? Wouldn't that always be the case? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, this is true because this is just a constant number. Um, but the point is, as long as we have something here such that when you plug it into the characteristic equation, you get zero, you'll have a solution to the equation. And yes, this is always the case. Um, so now what we kind of need to do is we need to understand these uh, quantities like e to the a plus b i t. I want some good way of thinking about this. Okay, and the answer will be something called Euler's formula, um, but let's get to that in a moment. So as a, uh, so in order to understand e to the a plus b i t, uh, recall the definition of e to the t, this function. Can anyone remind me what the correct definition of e to the t is? As a hint, this is something from calc two, not from calc one. Is it a series expansion? Yes, it is a Taylor series expansion. Correct definition of e to the x is e to the x should be defined as one plus x over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial, etc. So this is going to be equal to a sum of from i is equal to zero up to infinity of x to the i over i factorial. Okay, this is what you should kind of ingrain into your head what, how we should define the exponential function. Once we define it this way, and once we prove certain things about it, for instance, this uh, converges absolutely. And what is its radius of convergence? I'll just remind you, it has an infinite radius of convergence. Once you know some of these properties about this series, then you can start proving some of the identities that you know and love about e to the x. For instance, 
the derivative of e to the x is equal to e to the x. That's something that you can prove by first checking that this series converges absolutely, it has an infinite radius of convergence, therefore we can take derivatives by taking derivatives of each term and checking that when we take derivatives of each term, we exactly get back e to the x, right? So all these nice properties about e to the x, about the derivative and integral, should be seen as coming from this definition and from these important properties about this series. Okay. So what we should do is once we have the correct definition of e to the x, we should try to understand by plugging into this definition, what is e to the i x? Well, by definition, if we're taking this definition of e to the x, then e to the i x has to be exactly one plus i x over one plus i x quantity squared over two factorial plus i x cubed over three factorial plus i x to the fourth over four factorial, et cetera, et cetera. Is this step okay? Notice something important here uh, to, to manipulate this series, I do need to know that this series converges absolutely and that it has an infinite radius of convergence. In particular, this absolutely convergent property is important because if I slap absolute values onto every term, well, the absolute value of each, any of these terms is just x squared plus uh, two squared because the magnitude of i is just one. So, if we slap absolute values everywhere, we just recover e to the x. Can you explain what or, radius of convergence is real quick? Uh, yes, so basically I'll just do it in words. Um, whenever you write a, a series like this, it's possible that this series um, describes functions only locally and that the series diverges when you plug in x's of a, when x's are too far away. Um, so this is something that you discuss in uh, Calc 2 when you write down, say, infinite series corresponding to uh, like uh, geometric growth or arithmetic growth or things like that. Um, but essentially what this means is that this, this series, will converge for all values of x. No matter how big x is, like even if x is a million, when I plug in a million and I look at this series, and by looking at this series, really what I mean is taking partial sums. So I look at the sequence one, one million over one, one million squared over two, plus one plus one million, plus one million squared over two, plus a million cubed over three factorial, right? When I make the sequence of partial sums that will always converge no matter what x I put in. There are certain Taylor series where if you start plugging in certain large x's, for instance, or small x's, and you start looking at the sequence of partial sums, then they'll diverge. Okay, got you, thank you. Okay, so absolute convergence essentially means that I can split up this uh, series into two series. So we need absolute convergence in order to do my next step. Absolute convergence enables me to say that this is equal to, well, I'm gonna make subs one subsequence by taking the evens. So I'll look at one plus what is i x squared? Negative x squared. Negative x squared over two factorial. What's i to the fourth? X squared. Yeah, exactly. Plus x to the fourth over four factorial. And next I'll have minus x to the sixth over six factorial, blah, blah, blah. Here are the, uh, the 
yeah, the odd terms, even though they have even powers, it's one, three, five, et cetera. Plus, and then over here, I'll have the terms involving i, and I'll simplify it down to where there's only one i. So here I'll have i x. Here, i cubed is the same thing as negative i, so minus i x cubed over three factorial. Next one's gonna be plus i x to the fifth over five factorial. Uh, minus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does anyone recognize this infinite series? This is another one that you discussed when you were in Calc 2. Is it like sine? Very close. Um, Remember, it's definitely gonna be one of the trig functions. Uh, if I plug in x is equal to zero, what do I get? Oh, you get one. I get one. So it can't be sine, but it should be one of the trig functions such that when I plug in zero, I get one. So a good guess is? Probably cosine then. Yeah, cosine of x. And then this one, if I factor out an i, then I'll get i times x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial. And this one now, when I plug in x is equal to zero, I'll get zero. So here, this should be sine x. Sine x. Thus, I get e to the i x is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x. And this is a very famous formula known as Euler's formula. Oh, sorry. This allows us to interpret these expressions of e to a complex number. Anytime that I have e to a complex number, then I'm just going to write out precisely this. e to the ix is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x. And moreover, another fact that you can use is if you define the exponential of a complex number to be exactly this, basically you use the Taylor series definition of e, then the complex, then e to a complex number has all the nice properties that you expect from e to a real number. For instance, the derivative properties hold, so d over dt of e to the a plus bi is exactly equal to uh, t is equal to a plus bi e to the a plus b i t. And moreover, um, e to the mu times e to the lambda is equal to e to the mu plus lambda, where now mu and lambda are complex numbers. All these properties, all the properties that you expect from the exponential function, it continues to have even when you have complex numbers um, in its exponents, and you can prove all these things from the Taylor series definition of the exponential function. Okay. So wait, I have a question. Sure. So you're saying that we um, can only make these conclusions that all that these have like the same properties of um, exponents we've worked with only if like the Taylor expansion to all this ends up being in this form cosine of x plus i sine of x is that what you're saying um no I don't think I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking but I don't think that's what I'm saying what I'm saying is the following uh first we revisit the definition of e to the x. And the definition is in terms of Taylor series. And then we ask, what happens if I plug in some complex number for x? Or what happens if I look at something like e to the i x? Just following the definition, in particular for e to the i x, I see e to the i x is cosine of x plus i sine of x. 
So in particular, I can ask you, what is e to the 3 plus 4i? Well, first of all, using the fact that all the other aspects of complex numbers and exponents follow through, that's something else that you can see from the Taylor series definition. I know that this is equal to e to the 3 times e to the 4i, right? What is e to the 4i according to this definition? Cosine of x plus um, like i sine of, oh wait, no, sorry. Cosine of four. Exactly, cosine of four yeah. plus i sine of four. Yeah. This is yeah. what I'm saying that you can do with, whenever you have an e to a complex number, you can split it into a real part and a purely imaginary part. The real part you already know how to handle. And every time you have an e to an imaginary number, you can always write that as cosine of the coefficient plus i sine of the coefficient. Of okay, I. Gotcha. thank you. That's what I'm saying. Are we all right with this? Any other questions here? Okay, so armed with this knowledge, we can work on our, our problem that we're interested in. So let me do, uh, yeah, so, okay. The next part, so next, recall, from uh, Friday, if u of t plus i v of t satisfies or solves a second order homogeneous linear diffy q, then what? that u of t and v of t are both solutions? u of t and v of t are solutions. Okay, so now let's do an actual example because we have all the pieces that we need to uh, find full families of solutions. Okay, so let's get started. Let's do a very explicit example. Um, let's do, let's solve y double prime um, plus 2y prime um, plus, make sure that I'm doing this right, 2y is equal to 0. Okay, so we're going to do this one. Okay, what is the characteristic equation associated to this differential equation, the second order linear homogeneous differential equation? x squared plus 2x plus 2 equals 0. x squared plus 2x plus 2 is equal to 0. What is uh, b squared minus 4ac? Is it positive, negative, or 0? Negative. Yeah, this is going to be negative 4, right? I get four minus four times two, so this is negative four. So uh, what are the roots of this polynomial? Now is the time for the quadratic formula, right? So it's negative one. Um, negative one, two. b is two, right? Oh, sorry, um, two, um, then plus or minus, 
uh, 4 minus 8, so that would be negative 4 um, over 2. Yeah, very good. And we can simplify this further, right? What does What's the square root of negative 4? 2i. Yeah, very good. So this is equal to negative 2 plus or minus 2i all over 2, which is the same thing as negative 1 plus or minus i. Right. Do we agree that these are the roots? Yeah. Excellent. So a root, or so a solution is e to the negative one plus i, and also uh, this times t and also e to the negative one minus i. Both of these correspond to solutions. Okay, but these aren't quite the real solutions that we want. So how can I rewrite this? e to the negative one plus i times t. You could first do something that's real and a complex component. Yeah, I can break it into a real component and a complex component, which is like e to the negative t plus e to the i t. And then I can use my rules of exponentiation to write it as e to the negative t times e to the i t. Do we agree with this? anyone disagree with this? Does anyone have anything to say at all? I agree. Excellent. By Euler's formula, how do we rewrite e to the i t? Cosine of t plus i sine of t. Cosine of t plus i sine of t. Very good. So a general solution, or not a general solution, sorry, a solution is e to the negative t cosine of t plus i times e to the negative t sine of t. What does our theorem about complex solutions to differential equations tell us? E to the e negative. Go ahead. E to the negative t times cosine of t is going to be a solution like our u of t, and then the v of t would be e to the negative t sine of t. Exactly. We already know this from our theorem, but actually, what I'd like to ask you to do is uh, please check. So check that e to the negative t cosine of t solves y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y is equal to this. So just check this really quick. Maybe some people should check this one and some people should check this one. Just a good exercise. We talk about these um, theorems, but it's good to actually check that they hold in practice.
a bit of a tedious computation, I know, because you have to take the second derivative of this thing, which is going to leave you with four terms, more or less. But nonetheless, it's not too bad, and it's good to verify these things. To take a step back, we know it's true because of the principle of superposition, right? Um, it's not quite the principle of superposition. So it's it's kind of the reverse of the principle of superposition. The principle super the sorry the principle of superposition would say if I knew this was a solution and I knew this was a solution, then this whole thing would definitely be a solution because it's a linear combination. It's a constant coefficient times one solution plus another constant coefficient times the other solution. But here, we're kind of going the other way. We said, this whole thing is a solution. And I can write it as a real part plus i times another real part. In other words, a real part and a purely imaginary part. And the theorem that goes the other way says, whenever I can write it like this, then I know this is a solution and this is a solution. So it's like, okay. a, the, it's like a special reverse of the principle of superposition. Does that theorem still hold if i is negative? You mean if i have a minus i to the something? Yes. Well, essentially yes, because then I just move the negative into the function, right? Like a plus b, or sorry, a minus bi is just equal to a plus i times negative b. Okay, so that's what we will do if we were checking the other solution from earlier exactly. on? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Thank you. The point will be, even though we produce two solutions, well, these two solutions are two different complex solutions in a certain sense, but for just one of these solutions, I get two real solutions, right? From just, if I forget about this one, and I just remember this one, I'm still able to get two real solutions out of this one from this theorem. Mm -hmm. Did anyone uh, finish the check that this actually satisfies the differential equation or that this one does? I checked E the negative T sine of T and okay. it worked. Yeah, okay. It's, it's good to check, but I'm not going to go through with it because it's kind of just a tedious calculation. Um, okay, so these are solutions. Uh, the next question is, can I build the general solution from these two real solutions? What should I, what should I check to determine whether the general solution can be written in terms of these two? Linear independence. We need to check linearly, linear independence. So in particular, I need to check the Ronskian W of e to the negative t cosine of t and e to the negative t sine of t. Right? Once I check the Ronskian and check that these two are, that the determinant of the Ronskian of these two functions is not everywhere zero, then the whole family can be built out of these two. So this is something that I can check alongside. You know. Would, oh, if yep. you took the other complex solution, mm -hmm. would that result in the same family, like final family? It would result in, well, it certainly will result in the same collection of functions, but it'll be parameterized in a slightly different way. We, we can take a look at that after we've done with this. Um, the idea is the following. Well, actually, let's just do it now. Um, here, if I took e to the minus i, minus one plus i t, then I got the functions e to the negative t cosine of t and e to the negative t sine of t. If instead I took this uh, solution, so I used, sorry, trying to fit this all on one page, uh, e to the negative one minus i t, then this would give me uh, e to the negative t times, um, e to the i times negative t, which is equal to e to the negative t cosine of negative t 
plus i sine of negative t. What's the cosine of the negative of something? Is cosine even or odd as a function? Gonna need an answer on this one. Cosine of negative t is equal to be a negative cosine t. Um well not quite. Um it'll be cosine of t. Cosine of t is perfectly symmetric, right? If I plug in the negative, I get the same thing as if I had plugged in the the positive version. It's sine of t that, that kind of switches like that. But you can see that from pictures. Cosine looks like this. So if I look at what happens over here, the function's at the same height as if I looked over here. It's symmetric around the uh, x-axis, or the y-axis, sorry. Right? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that so makes sense. This one, whereas sine is what we call odd, or when you flip around the uh, y-axis, you get the negative. So here I'd get plus i times negative sine of t. And so here, my two different solutions would be e to the negative t cosine of t and e to the negative t minus sine of t. So in other words, the family that I get from here is different from the family that I got here just by a negative sign on one of the terms. But if they're linearly independent, then they would be the same family because that negative could be in the constant. Yeah, so yes. What, what I should say is that as long as the Ronskian of one of these is non-zero, then either of these two will give you a family. And the two families look like C1 e to the negative t cosine of t plus C2 e to the negative t uh, sine of t, or C1 of e to the negative t cosine of t plus C2 times negative e to the negative t sine of t. So I, I, while what you're saying is essentially correct, I do want to point out that any function that you can write this way, you can obviously write this way and vice versa, but these are slightly different parameterizations of the family because if there is a certain um, function that is written as uh, C1 something plus C2 something over here, like say one comma one, if C1 is one here and C2 is one here, that's the same as having uh, constants one and negative one over here, right? Yeah. And similarly, if I can write a function as A, B, so that is a times this thing plus b times this thing. That's the same thing as writing it a comma negative b down here. The point is that any time that I have two functions such that the Ronskin of the two functions is not zero, that will give me a family. And all those families are the same in the sense that they all represent the same collections of functions, but they represent them in different ways. Like each different pair of functions whose Ronskin is non-zero will represent a given function with a different collection of, of numbers here. If, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, now a second thing to check, this that we should have checked kind of before having this whole discussion, is what's the Ron scan? So we need to check the Ron scan of these is going to be e to the negative t cosine of t is the first term. Down here, I need to take the derivative. So I get e to the negative t cosine of t plus e to the negative t uh, times negative sine of t. Here I'll get e to the t sine of t, and or sorry, e to the negative t, and then e to the negative t sine of, t oh, sh sorry, I should have a negative here. And then a negative here, negative e to the negative t sine of 
t plus uh, e to the t cosine of t. Did I do this right? If I didn't, it's going to cause me a headache. Does everyone agree that I took the derivatives correctly here? Yeah, you forgot a negative in front of the t in the exponential at the bottom right term. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, and when I take determinants here, I'm going to get, well, it's going to be kind of a long thing. Um, over here, I'm going to get a negative e to the negative 2t uh, sine cos plus e to the negative 2t cos squared minus, so this thing, minus, here I'm going to get a negative e to the negative 2t uh, sine cos. And here I'm going to get a plus e to the negative 2t. Um, uh, I should have a negative here. Minus uh, sine squared, right? Do we agree? And so with all this being done, the terms with sine and cosine will cancel with each other. And we'll be left with e to the negative 2t cosine squared plus e to the negative 2t sine squared, which is just equal to e to the negative 2t. Does e to the negative 2t ever vanish? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm off the page. What can we conclude from this calculation? That it's never zero. Yes. E to the negative 2t is never zero. So it is not the zero function. So what? It's linearly independent. Yes. These two functions are linearly independent in an appropriate sense, which means we can find the fundamental solution by finding the vector that, or the linear arrangement of them that creates the solution vector. That's right. So uh, e to the negative t uh, cosine of t comma e to the negative t sine of t is a fundamental system or probably more importantly what i wrote above was true the general solution is c1 e to the negative t cosine of t plus c2 e to the negative t sine of t whenever i want to write a general solution I need to check that the wrong skin of the two functions is not the zero function. I checked, indeed it's not. Therefore, the general solution to this differential equation takes this shape. What's going on with this function? Well, let me pick uh, c1 is equal to one, c2 is equal to zero. Essentially, if I set c1 to 1, c2 to 0, then I've got e to the negative t times cosine of t. So that means I have kind of this envelope corresponding to e to the negative t. And then I have cosine, which is going in between this envelope. You scoot the paper down. Oh, yeah, sure. This is what a solution to this differential equation looks like, the curve in the, in the middle. Anyone think of the physical situation that this is modeling, or this might be modeling? Maybe like a pendulum, like 
going back and forth and then like yeah kind of a pendulum going back and forth that over time the amplitude of the pendulum kind of slows down to to nothing right or another thing that this could be modeling is like if you have a uh, like shocks on your bike or something like that and you go over a bump then at first or like in your car at first you're going to have like a big oscillation and your car is going to slowly be oscillating but hopefully if you have good springs or shocks then the oscillations will generally decrease in magnitude and get smaller and smaller and smaller right? great um why don't you do another example oh any any questions about this before i continue so we have to like come up with the roots first and then we check the ronsky and if that if that equals a non-zero function then we can come up with a general solution like is that that's the correct solution? that's correct the the way to proceed is to first find either one or two solutions here using one root of the polynomial we will be able to find two solutions and then you check that their ronsky is non-zero therefore they are a fundamental system of solutions and a general solution can be written so you said we can use one of the roots to find these solutions. Like what happens with the other root? Like, is that like another family of fundamental solutions? Yeah, so that goes exactly back to our discussion here. One family gave, or one, one root, e to the uh, negative one plus i, gave me this family, right? That's, that's, what, that's all the work that we just did. Do you agree? can't see both but the other uh, solution the other root negative 1 minus i gives me this pair of solutions e to the negative t cosine of t and negative e to the negative t sine of t okay so that's that's different from here it's off by a negative sign so by the by nearly the exact same calculation, the Ronskian of this pair will also be non-zero. In fact, the Ronskian of this pair will be negative e to the negative 2t. So this pair is also a fundamental system. And so we get back to here. Here is what we just found. This is the general family of solutions using e to the uh, negative one plus i times t. And here is the general family of solutions. It's the same family, but parameterized differently, associated to e to the negative one minus i t. So what I mean is any function that you can write in some way using this family, you can also write it in this family, but the coefficients have to be different. So same family, but different parameterizations. Does that make oh, sense? Right, you can just change the con like the constant would just flip. Exactly, out. exactly. Any function, so for instance, this function down here, which was written as t to the negative t cosine of t, I set c1 to 1 and I set c2 to 0. Well, in this family, it's also given by 1 comma 0, right? 1 comma 0 up here, also is associated to the one comma zero down here. But down here, the solution e to the negative t sine of t is associated to zero one, right? I'm taking zero for c1 and I'm taking one for c2. Well, in this family, that's associated to the constants zero comma negative one. So different constants for this family zero one will correspond to the constant zero negative one in this family. Thank you for going through that. It's getting a bit messy, but do you understand kind of what, what I'm talking about when I say that there are different parameterizations? Yeah, that makes sense. It goes back to the exact idea of vector spaces, where in essence, one is asking, how do you get to a certain vector using these two vectors? Or how do you get to this vector using these two vectors. This is the same vector, but 
our, our, the way that we're writing our family is different. So we're going to have different uh, coefficients, but nonetheless, the family is still the same. The family here being interpreted as R2. All the points that we can hit by linear combinations of these two versus all the uh, points that we can hit via linear combinations of these two, they're the same. So is the distinction in, um, in the constants, like is that significant ever? Um, the answer is yes, but we won't necessarily see you. Uh, what, what I should say here is this is a phenomenon that is completely everywhere in more linear algebra. So essentially what we're doing here is these two vectors are called a basis. Um, that's what we call a minimal spanning linearly independent set. And what we're saying here is that there's a change of basis which passes in between these two bases. And that's essentially what's happening here. This is like one basis for the vector space of solutions. And this is a different basis for the vector space of solutions. And understanding all the different possible change of bases is very important, but we won't really get to explore that too deeply in this class. But if you go on to take more linear algebra, which you should, then this idea will come up like all the time forever. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In a certain sense, this is like all of my research. In, I mean, that's a, that's a drastic simplification, but um, there's a huge, huge, huge amount of math that goes into studying these change of bases, but these two bases are still parametrizing the same space. So the answer is yes. You should keep in mind the distinction between two different families or two different parametrizations parametrizing the same space or the same collection of functions. Okay, that's a long discussion and how much of our class time have I used up? Almost all of it. I plan for doing two sections today and we're gonna do one section, but that's totally fine. I think that we are doing, we're having good discussions, so I'm happy with how our pace is going. Um, what I would like for you to do is a very similar exercise, um, which is find the general solution Uh, y double prime plus y is equal to zero. Any questions for how things are going so far? Has anyone finished? 
Wait, we just pick one of the roots to work with, right? That's correct. One of the roots will be sufficient to get both real solutions. Okay. So what's the characteristic equation of this uh, differential equation? X squared plus one equals zero. What are the roots of this? I and negative I. I and negative I, good. Okay, and so for instance, we could take either e to the i t or e to the negative i t as uh, what we're going to work with. I suspect most of you chose e to the i t, so I'll work with e to the negative i t first. Actually, I'll do both. I'll just do e to the i t. What is e to the i t? Cosine, cosine of t plus i sine t. Cosine of t plus i sine of t. And from this, we produce the fundamental system, cosine of t and sine of t. Right? In other words, the general solution here would be written C1 cosine of t uh, plus C2 sine of t. Whereas if I examine e to the negative i t, then I'll get cosine of negative t plus i sine of negative t, which is the same thing as cosine of t uh, minus i sine of t. Or maybe I should write it as plus i times negative sine of t. And so I get the fundamental system cosine of t negative sine of t or writing the family as C1 cosine of t uh, plus C2 times negative sine of t. Either of these is a correct answer for the general uh, solution. This is a general solution, and this is a general solution. In particular, any function that you can write as some coefficient C1 and C2 here can be written as different coefficients of C1 and C2 here, right? So, so either of, what I'm trying to say is, either of these is a correct answer. This is a correct answer, this is a correct answer. And then in a test situation, you would want us to like check the Ronsky for this, right? Um, so what is probably better to do is to check once and for all, the general form, if we have um, e to the a plus bi, then our two supposed solutions are supposed to be e to the a uh, cosine of b and e to the a uh, sine of b. One should just check the Ronskians of these, or say w of e to the a cosine of b e to the a sine of b. Check this once and for all in, in a great deal of generality. You'll see that this is not equal to zero. And so pretty much henceforth, we know, like maybe you should do this. I, I urge you to actually do this computation. I won't make it homework, but or at least I won't take it in, but I urge you to compute the Ronskian of these two functions. But once you see that these are non-zero, then you always know that the pair of solutions that you get will always give you a fundamental system. Does that make sense? Yeah, and if we were to do that, do we derive it in terms of A? Well, you'll have two functions, A and B, but the B stuff should all essentially go away. It, I think this should end up giving you e to the negative 2a as your, or e to the negative 2at. Sorry, there should be, there should be t's in here. I'm so sorry. Um, this would be e to the at cosine of bt and e to the at sine of bt. You take derivatives in terms of t. I'm sorry. Does 
Is this okay? Yeah, that's all good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to discuss today is the kind of Oh, okay. Uh, here's another question. A general solution, or not a general solution, a specific solution here, well, two specific solutions are the actual cosine function and the actual sine function, right? So here, some actual solutions involve or look like this. Oh, you can't see that, right? The cosine function looks like this. And the sine function looks like this. And of course, we can get all the scaled versions by taking, say, C1 to be 100 and C2 to be 0, and I'd get 100 times cosine or 100 times sine. All of these are solutions to this differential equation. So now I want to point out the following remark. Um, when our roots uh, to the characteristic equation, When the two roots had negative real part, right? Just as in our first example, our first example that we did today was the roots were negative one plus or minus i. So that could be this, right? These have negative real part. This could be negative one plus i, and this could be negative one minus i. Then the behavior of the solution is damped by some exponential function involving the real part. So in general, these look like this, some, some sinusoidal behavior that's getting damped as t goes to infinity. As we saw with those, this most recent example, when my roots are i or negative i, or in other words, when the uh, roots of my characteristic equation have zero real part, then the solutions looks like sines or cosines. So they look like this, going off with the same amplitude. What can you guess happens when the roots of the characteristic equation have positive real part? Amplitude increases. Yeah, the amplitude is going to increase because what you're going to have out front is an e to the positive a t. So the, the envelope, so to speak, is going to look like this. And then you're going to have some sort of sinusoidal behavior in here. So you're going to have drastically blowing up behavior where the solution is going to be oscillating between two bounds and the bound is increasing as time goes up. In particular, it's only in this case where you're going to have a limit as t goes to infinity for the solution. If I examine limit as t goes to infinity in this regime, then they're going to approach some limit. But here, this function doesn't approach anything as t goes to infinity. And this function certainly doesn't approach anything as t goes to infinity because it's oscillating between larger and larger positive and negative numbers. So these are kind of three different behaviors that you can expect from uh, second order homogeneous linear differential equations, um, depending on what the characteristic equation is. Okay. Any questions here? Perhaps one last comment to make before we end for the day is that it is very interesting and you should kind of perhaps remember when you think about why differential equations are so difficult in general is that these are a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero in a certain sense these are extremely simple differential equations all the a b and c all the coefficients are constant but we're already seeing 
vastly different possible behavior of the solutions, depending on whether the characteristic uh, polynomial has two distinct roots or has uh, two complex conjugate roots. And then if there are two complex conjugate roots, you should check what the real part is and you're gonna have very different behavior. So even differential equations that look very similar can have solutions which vary radically differently in terms of their behavior. So all of this stuff is coming out of some very simple differential equations. I haven't even talked about repeated roots yet, which we'll do tomorrow. Any questions? I have a question about just the exam. Are you going to post um, solutions? Uh, I hadn't planned on it, but I would be very happy to actually discuss anyone's exam one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's usually a more uh, beneficial uh, way to go through things. All right, thanks. All right, well, if that's being said, um, have a nice afternoon and stay safe this week. Please uh, take care of yourselves, uh, whatever you decide to do. With your non class time. Do you have office hours after class today? Yeah, I do. Give me about five minutes. I'll be back at 105. Sounds good. Thank you. I had a little comment on oh, the sure. grade book thing. Uh, I totally misread how you actually took points off. Like you had the whole list of what points could be taken off, and then you put a check mark. Mm. And what I thought I got right or wrong was good. So okay. it's all good there. Yeah, there are there are many comments, and not all of them are applied to any of your given yeah. problems. That's an important note. Had to reread that a couple times. Sorry about that. No, you're good. I understand now. All right. Have a nice you. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.